I'm going to have to go from some notes. And the thing is, is I've got to leave time for Chuck to talk, you know. Uh, I'm glad you came today. I'm so glad so many of you came. And, uh, you know, you see what my title of my talk is about. Well, today I'm going through stage 10 of chemotherapy. I've been really blessed, okay, tolerating it well and have not had a lot of the impacts a lot of people have. And that's a great thing. But, you know, kind of a serious talk. Okay, so I'm going to have to mic up be louder, huh? Okay. Thank you. You know, have you ever thought about how you want to be remembered, okay, by your relatives, by friends of yours, especially when you die, you know? Or have you maybe you've thought about how you, uh, how you want to remember yourself as you get older. When you look back on your life and you're not nearly as active as you are today, well, you know, for me, sometimes I feel like I've lived a lot of different types of lives, and this idea about service, I was trying to figure out when did maybe I first start getting interested, and it was kind of... Watching the cerebral palsy telethon back about the fifth grade, one of our neighbors or friends called up and said, hey, why don't we go around and collect money for it? So we did, you know, got our, our Hershey's cocoa can, poked a hole in it, whatever, and basically uh, mom drove us down there to the Civic Center Music Hall, and we turned in the money. We weren't on TV. We just did it to, to get the money. I hope none of my friends were, you know, keeping half of it, but, you know, I think we all meant well. And, you know, in terms of fundraising, a few years ago, and you have to realize I'm an I'm a urban planner, okay, and we had a great uh, planning school down in Norman, and I had a chance to realize that we really hadn't uh, been able to get a certain scholarship in Dutch, one of our professors. We were about $22,000 short, which for a lot of public sector employees is kind of hard to raise, but I and Danny O'Connor and some other folks uh, teamed up, and we raised the money and got it done in about three or four months. So now there's like three endowed scholarships for students, you know, a gift that will keep giving, we hope. But, you know, it's not just about fundraising. Uh, and I want you to kind of realize that, you know, if I could do these things, you know, Larry Hopper, really anybody can, okay? You just got to want to. And, and, you know, not all the efforts I've been involved with have succeeded, but usually even a half success on a volunteer effort is a good thing. Well, you know, cancer changes lives. Changed mine back at age 27. I hope my talk in some small way helps change yours today, okay? And, you know, we can all do more to make a difference and to cultivate multicultural unity. You know, possibilities, changing lives, changing, changing people, changing communities. A lot of it's about unity and about working in the community. And basically, uh, you know, a lot of times you'll find it's rewarding. And sometimes when you're thinking about volunteering, you kind of need to have that spirit within you. I think that's kind of like, if it's going to be, it's up to me, okay? So you do the things that you need to do. And the great thing about this is that a gift will often, a gift you give or something that you volunteer for, it comes back and helps you later on in kind of a cosmic way. You know, for me, back when I was in college, I felt like only, only at OU, okay, Chuck, did you go to OU by chance or just live down there? Okay. Well, there's a lot of OU comments in here, so if you're an OSU fan, just feel good you beat us in the, uh, you know, Big 12 tournament for the men. <laughs> okay? Because the rest of this is about O and my brother, you know, OSU fan, you know. Hmm. My brother Mike over here, the taller, more handsome guy that got the brains, you know, <laughs> more than I got. But at any rate, you know, the only, only charity I could afford was blood. And, you know, last summer when I went to give blood, I wasn't allowed to. And that's when we figured out that something was seriously wrong. And so, in some respects, that was payback, I guess. Because you know, we might not have found out until this was stage four or later. So the things that you give away or that you help with, a lot of times there's a connection that comes back and helps you. Well, now Joyce, the lady here with the camera, yeah, I told her, I said, this is going to be posted in a couple of weeks or so. Back in college, she had this poster on the wall of kind of a Rube Goldberg machine. You know, acquainted with the game Mousetrap, right? You know, where a crank turns this, a ball goes down. Yeah. Well, she had this uh, poster had a Rube Goldberg machine, and a monkey was cranking it, okay? Didn't have my face or anything like that. But, the, but what it said on it, the caption was, ideas don't work unless we do. So we can think about all these great things that ought to be done, ways to serve the community, do stuff. But somebody has to do those things. And it's not that hard. Not really. Uh, so, you know, last summer, I went into summer, and I didn't tell you this. My boss, Jason's here. But I could kind of see, and maybe he could too, that this was going to be a summer that wasn't going to be so busy, no, not so crushing. And I thought, man, I'm going to take two one-week vacations and take off some Fridays and do some stuff around the house, you know. And I had all these plans in mind. About, and about June 10th, I thought, this is where it starts. And I think June 12th is when I went to the blood drive because God had other plans. Or 
if you're not, you know, that spiritual, maybe it's the universe that calls for you. I don't know. But basically, God had other plans, and he has at other times in my life, too, and I thought I was doing it just like I wanted to. So, you know, we, uh, we had, we figured out that, yeah, you know, I wasn't going to get to give blood, and something was seriously wrong, and it turned out to be colon cancer. And, uh, you know, I'm not complaining too much, because, you know, I wound up uh, losing about 20 pounds I needed to lose, got this cool white hairdo and beard that I didn't used to have a year ago, you know, used to be somewhat red, not anymore, but, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and I found this out kind of through my, one of my favorite areas, Bricktown, Bricktown Blood Drive. Well, you know, moms and dads have such an influence on more than just their own kids. Back when I was uh, going into the eighth grade, a friend of mine, uh, his dad owned a business in Bricktown, AJ knows this story, and basically uh, we were having to he, he had us load these salty cowhides onto a truck, and we had just started playing football. My knuckles were bare from getting down a four-point stance, and that salt really burned my hands. Well, you know, his dad wound up paying us 20 bucks for about six hours' work, and this was 19, oh, it would have been the fall of 1970. I bet the minimum wage was $1.50, you know. Paid us about twice what the minimum wage was worth. And I think he did it because he was trying to invest in us kids about how, you know, there's different ways of working, work smarter, et cetera. And, you know, in the case of being a coach, you know, a lot of times that's what you're doing is you're investing in your own kids, sure, but you're investing in other kids and helping them to come more, you know. So, but I was going to say that, uh, and Mike may remember this story differently, but I remember about Christmas in 1964, our parents came home one afternoon on a Sunday. They had this sack full of toys. You could tell they were toys here sticking out the top. I think I was hiding underneath the coffee table or something, and I looked up, and they said, kids, you know, these toys, uh, these aren't for you. you know, Uncle Kenneth, his family kind of going through a tough patch. So basically, as I understood it, they had bought these toys for my uncle's family. And uh, kind of an interesting bit of service that I thought about probably more later. Uh, you know, mom and dad, different generation, maybe not as many opportunities to be service-minded, but they did different things for us and for others. Mom rotated being a homeroom mother, you know, among the different uh, classes, maybe Patty the first year and Mike the next and then me. Uh, mom might have been Cub Master one year. Was she a den mom? She was a den mom for Cub Scouts for Mike. Not for me, but, you know, it's okay. He was always the <laughs> taller, more handsome, smarter one, you know, so, you know, it's okay. I was the baby, so I got the benefit of all of them. So, you know, um, there are other things that we did. And then, you know, really, uh, maybe part of why I became a city planner is related to all this. Back after the, uh, after the seventh grade, I uh, was out with my dad for about a week going across the country. And I bought this book, The Autobiography of Malcolm X. Anybody read it in here by chance? It's an excellent source of information about growing up black in America in the 1920s and 30s, well, 40s. Probably still pretty relevant. Uh, a lot of street smart stuff in there. Malcolm X was probably a more radical leader, but in those final, the final year of his life, really, he came a lot more like Martin Luther King. I think anybody would, would agree to that. Whoa, uh oh. Oh, now we've lost it. I might have to have some help, but maybe I can talk loud enough to make this work. I'll just put it in my pocket. Don't put it in your pocket. Don't? <laughs> well, what do you think's down there is going to make any noise? And, yeah. because, because what you don't know is, as age 27, when I had cancer, it was testicular cancer. And, through a process, they make it to where you have half as many as you used to have, but being a good hopper, it's basically all we ever needed compared to most guys, okay? <laughs> I mean, give us two and rumble's hard to get along with, you know? I mean, <laughs> now folks, this is a serious talk today, you know? <laughs> but basically, uh, you know, uh, you know my, but your parents influence you and, uh, and you know, and part of the thing I'm telling you that is that, you know, we had a public housing project was built about a block and a half from our house, tore down most of, a lot of Trosper Park, old growth trees that had been there for hundreds of years, so I used to hike around. They tore it down to build a public housing project, and so at the start of the seventh grade, we had instant integration. We all got along well. Seventh grade worked out well, and, and uh, you know, what I realized is probably the strongest guy on the team, the other tackle, was a guy named Daryl Shaw, black guy from the projects. His mom taught him how to box, et cetera, et cetera. Single mom, these two kids. Frida Shaw was his sister. Some of you might know a Frida Shaw. I don't know. But at any rate, uh, I picked him. Worked it up where he was my hitting partner, you know, the person that you 
do pregame drills with, pre-practice drills with, piggybacks, wheelbarrows, all that stuff. And uh, made me a better player, made him a better player, we got along well. When I moved to Texas, same thing. I was trying to figure out, how are you going to get a starting position? So I figured out who is basically the other big, strong tackle, and really out of respect, you know, picked him to be my partner. You know, in 1971, 72, most of these schools had just integrated. I think the coaches appreciated it. Uh, our JV coach was a black gentleman who eventually was superintendent of schools there for years. And, you know, Dangerfield pretty, <laughs> was a pretty good football school. But at any rate, uh, you know, hopefully these kinds of things help unify our team in kind of a silent way, just picking a guy who's not another white guy to be your partner. Well, cancer strike age 27. I know I've got to speed this up a little bit. Uh, oh, volunteer, it helps your career. Now that my boss is here, you know, uh, I realized after a while that I needed to move to South May where the boss was so it would be easier to talk to him and stuff. And, you know, I realized that South May where we are, just south of the river, is kind of an armpit in terms of litter. You know, people litter not just our property but a lot of properties. And uh, I'd done this when the kids were in high school at the Mount. Tried to organize sort of a bend over, a bend over day, bend over, pick up litter and stuff. And, <laughs> and it did for two years. This year I don't plan to because there's just too much else like this that I, you know, kind of try to cut something out. But, you know, it's important to try to do things like that, just picking up litter, improve the image of your area. But, you know, the, uh, I should, I'll go through this real briefly, but basically, you know, if you want to think about a great example of service, it's a fictional character but played by Jimmy Stewart, a guy who gave up his movie career for a while, uh, was a World War II bomber pilot squadron leader, basically, and came back and did all those great movies, you know. Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, It's a Wonderful Life. And, you know, in his case, uh, it's not like I ever saved my brother, you know, from a frozen pond and wound up getting an earache from it and losing my hearing, but, you know, actually, uh, because of these connections of people, we all touched so many other people's lives. You know, Joyce, back when oh, we were in college, she introduced Mike and Carol as sort of a blind date. Okay? I, at the time, I thought, they're probably not really compatible, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but I was wrong, you know? And so by knowing, knowing Joyce, Mike and Carol wind up with a wonderful marriage and two wonderful kids. And a lot of these connections, we all have them with people, you know? But at any rate, uh, you know, I, uh, I had a good, I've had a good career. I hope to have about five more years of it. But, you know, the years of raising kids and investing in other kids, that, uh, you know, that began to take over. But it took over after the business about the cancer strike at age 27. Because what I didn't really say is that after that happened, this was kind of a turning point in my adult life about thinking about service because I thought, wow, 27 years old, what have I done really to help out? And because I had just become a member of AICP the year before, to brag on myself, youngest guy to ever <laughs> get that, to earn that uh, in Oklahoma before or since, uh, you know, I thought, what I'm going to give back to my, my, uh, my profession. So, you know, I ran for a statewide chapter office for our trade industry group. And then after that, I was the president for two years, got to know a lot of people. And then after that, it's kind of when the years of raising kids and investing in other kids started, you know. Now, you know, really, the one who really did the most volunteering was Joyce. Uh, I did coach some teams and a science fair judge and diff it was on their little school board over there. But, uh, you know, really, uh, Joyce did, has done a lot. Uh, she and I coached a lot of teams. We didn't win a lot of teams at St. Fulton Air. We didn't win a lot of games. But part of the deal was this. About 1994 or 95, I figured out that, okay, we need to replace the playground. Went out there and looked at it. Basketball goals were not centered up because they'd put in a drainage project next to it so they didn't move the poles. And I looked at it and thought, huh, one was about eight and a half foot tall, one was about 10 and a half or 11 foot tall. <laughs> so it's kind of like, that's part of the problem. So when we replaced it, you know, and, and repaved it, put them at the proper height, and sure enough, my son's team started winning some basketball games. <laughs> but you know, sometimes it takes a fresh eye to look at problems so look at a problem and try to find a solution, volunteer, get it done. But that was a great project because another thing where um, God's plan, not mine, came up was that we did that in the summer and finally in the fall, a local nursery donated three trees that we wanted to put in place of where the old playground was. We planted it and I dropped off the kids at school and I thought, oh my gosh, 
they gave us some junk trees with all these shoots coming out of the root. And then, you know, what I, by the time I got to work, or maybe by late that morning, I thought, no, that's perfect, you know, because they were three brand, they were three trunks coming out of the same root. For some of us, we believe in the Holy Trinity, basically God and three persons, same root. And I thought, it's perfect. They didn't know they were doing it, but they donated the perfect plant for that playground. I talked to, you know, I made sure that when they built a new parish life center, I said, you're going to keep those Trinity trees, aren't you? And yeah, they weren't in the way. So, you know, those are all important things. But yeah, my wife, uh, you know, uh, been an inspiration to me. She also grounds me. There's two meanings to that. <laughs> I have a lot of interest in ideas, you know, and Joyce is kind of, you know, Larry, should you really do that? The latest thing is about electric cars, you know, but, but, uh, but by the same token, you know, so sometimes she kind of grounds me from doing things, but I always get a good perspective from Joyce on what to do to determine people, you know. Oh, you did? Well, <laughs> okay, no more, no more said about that then. <laughs> but as it turns out, What's in a number? You know, one of my good friends' dad worked for the phone company, and he moved from Dell City, Midwest City. The phone number was 737, the last four digits. Well, there's 20, 000, there were 20,000 numbers that could have been in the exchange in Midwest City. Marty probably remember that because his wife was over there. And you know, uh, what was Joyce's? 732, same four numbers. So for all I know, at age 12 or 13, I might have called their house by accident or something, but you know, just little coincidences, just to mention. So, you know, I tell you what, I'm going to just kind of go through the rest of it quickly. There's a slide here that kind of says this. You know, back about 50 years ago, when they were formulating, you know, the, when they had reformulated the alphabet and they identified what valves were, look what they did. A E I ends in O U, okay? In my case, I really owe O U for a lot of things. Not just meeting Joyce, but our three kids went there. They uh, had a great time there. Um, my great granddad's brother, well, I won't go into that story. But at any rate, uh, you know, we owe a lot to OU. And, uh, and I'm glad for that. You know, all three of our kids went there. And uh, because of, you know, and I think they've all had a good, pretty good heart for service. I won't go into what that is. But the bottom line is that, you know, uh, we can't just take care of our own kids. We've got to help others with theirs. People can start small in any type of volunteer endeavor, grow from there. And then my Fav 8, okay? Wow. You can read it. I'm just going to sit, just share a little bit of it. Through kind of a quirk in bylaws and, and uh, city codes, I'm the chair of the El Plumbo Alliance for Public Transportation. I'm a transit planner. And this is a group that could use a lot of help, okay? We just put on the first of our academy this week. A couple of folks were there in the area here that were there at the deal. And, uh, you know, we've got to find a way to put transit on a better footing. One way is to find people who really understand it and want to promote it. Possibilities, Inc. Now, the funnest way to serve possibilities is that on June 7th, we're going to have this dance called In the Group, okay? Great disco and other types of fun dancing, et cetera, and other things going on. You've got to come to that. And then the St. Martin Cemetery. Uh, somebody passed away. <laughs> somebody passed away this week, so I get to go out and find the Hell Buckley survey markers and find that five foot by 10 foot space. You know, it's a corporal act of mercy to bury the dead, okay? And, and to somehow help with that. Marriage Committee on Disability Concerns, Kathy, and uh, I think Pam Henry was going to come. Uh, you know, a great group of people who helped so much to make our community more disability friendly. Oh, Gold Dome Multicultural Society, Byron talked about that. And, uh, and then, of course, the Health, the Health Equity Network and Rotary Service Club, okay? A lot of people don't understand what, what it, oh, left out New View. Hmm. Nobody's here from New View, so that's okay. But, but New View is a great, a great organization that really uh, does a lot to, they don't, they don't just raise money. They actually employ a lot of people who have a disability to do different types of jobs. And to their credit, when they move their big facility, they'll move it to a spot on our bus route. So many people try to put in an agency or a business, and they don't pay enough attention to that. But you know what? Here are other things that everybody can do, something like this, something closer to your house, that fits what you want to do. And, you know, hey, a good word for St. Anthony Hospital. Uh, my doctor, Tina Wynn, has been great for me. The whole chemotherapy and operation, all that's great. I've got nothing but good to say about there. Turns out the same hospital I was born in. So don't wait too long or too late, okay? At some point, if you were to get cancer, it could be the thing that sparks you to change something. But if you wait too long, you might be finding this really a curtain call for you. And don't wait too late, you know? I mean. 
lot of us can do stuff up into our 70s, 75, whatever, then that's important. And then uh, the Beatles, you know, remember at the end of the Abbey Road album, for those of you who are old enough, and in the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make. Well, it's about love. St. Francis of Assisi gives you a lot of ways to actually apply that type of love to your fellow man. And then, but you go find your own anthem, okay? There's other ones I could tell you that are anthems that I try to find. These are sometimes the things that can roll around in your head and kind of help keep you sparked. So, I know that, you know, you might want to leave a good legacy that you are joyful to remember. And I think that's it. Step up to the plate. Get going. You can do it. So, that's it.